Okay. Okay, Tupac. Good morning. Kunashish, um, Ai Adi, Yake Fatsukini. It's good to see you all. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Alicia Marriott. I'm the Wellness and Prevention Specialist at Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. And uh, today we're going to talk about the healing centered engagement framework. Um, if you didn't get a chance to, uh, there's a sign in sheet in the back before you go. Um, if you want to leave your email address, I can send you my slide deck. And there's a couple of resources. I didn't print out everything that I'm referencing, um, so I cannot share those with you as well. Um, and then there's three handouts in the back for you to take. Next slide. So our learning objectives today, we'll do some intros um, briefly, uh, review trauma-informed care, and then dive into healing-centered engagement and the karma principles, and then we'll end with a group activity. Next slide. Um, so a little bit about myself um, and my family. Um, so I am, uh, let me try my, my Tlingit, um, introduction. Yuhatu asak alisha maria ak pla fik pas dalo ko salish kad lake ka ak ish hasawe luka hadi ka greek ak ke khat luak ak ye khat yati. Um, people call me alisha in English. That's the only name I have. Um, my mother's people are Salo Coast Salish, so a wireless tribe from Hope, British Columbia, um, Union Bar Band, First Nation, and my dad is Clinket, uh, Raven Sakai, or Lukahadi from Haines. So I'm a child of the Lukahadi. Um, so here's a map. It's kind of hard to see, but I just wanted to show you um, that my parents originally are only about 1,500 miles apart. Uh, this map is from Native dash land.ca. So if you're ever looking for whose ancestral homeland you're on, um, that's a good place to start. It's not always accurate. Um, sometimes it'll generalize like a group of tribes um, in an area, but I like that um, as a reference. And so the Coast Salish you can see are down here um, in this area, excuse me, so Washington and British Columbia, um, and then Haynes. Um, up there with the Red Star for my, my dad's family. So um, my, my mom and my dad and my sister and I are all kind of on a reconnecting journey. Um, my mom was adopted out of her tribe as an infant and we found her biological sister when I was a teenager, um, a little over 20 years ago. And then um, my dad um, and his family have been uh, reconnecting um, in the last 10 years or so, um, even though a lot of them are here. Um, so that's a little bit about me. That's my great grandma on the right, uh, my dad's grandma, um, Alice Fabulous. Her name is Squait. Um, I don't know what it means, but I think a long time ago, the person with that name survived uh, a landslide in Chilcat Lake. Um, and then down on the right, it's my grandma and I, uh, when my grandpa was. Um, uh, harvesting deer. Um, and then bottom right is a, a recent family photo. Um, and then on the left side is my mom's side of the family. And, um, and then bottom left is me and my nuclear blended family um, right now. So next slide, please. Um, if we can go around. I wanted to at least know your names and um, maybe where you're from and your role in education. Um, and one thing you're looking forward to this school year. And we will start right here. Good morning. My name is Anilia Wilson. My Greek name is Bloodlink, and I'm from Huna. Um, I work for Huna Heritage Foundation. And so I work with the schools a lot, with students and teachers. Um, and I, I'm just really um, interested in 
um, this session because I feel like it's it's good um, for the work I do with all ages of students, including teachers and myself. So thank you very much for this session. Hi, my name is Aubrey Hall. I was born and raised here in Juneau, and I'm a teacher assistant at the Montessori School. <laughs> um, something you're looking forward to this school year? I miss the kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lori. Um, I was born here, but I just moved back here in May. I got a school start, so I've been living out of the country a lot. Um, it's my first year teaching, so I'm pretty excited. We just did the business career. Uh, I also work at Montessori School, so congratulations. Did you share something you're looking forward to this school year? Yeah, probably my career. I just started. Yes. So. <laughs> um, and go back this way. Um, I'm Alex LeGrand. I am the school counselor at Dundee Community Middle School. Uh, I'm from Kentucky, but I've moved around a lot to the coast guard as well. Um, and I'm just looking forward to building relationships with the students. I'm Jessica Curry, and I work over at Harborview, and I will be teaching at Tier 4. I think this is one of the hard situations <laughs> of class. So and I guess the hope for this year is uh, uh, that's just a big question. <laughs> um, but yeah, just and enjoying and being present with them, with being with the kids that she was being with. Um, I'm Kat Porterfield. Um, I teach here in Juno. Um, now I'm in the TCL program as the reading teacher, so I'm really looking forward to the change because it's a very much different. I'm Cora. I work with Emily Siakit Keith. I'm a public language teacher. Uh, and I just want to say this. I thought I recognized you. You were in Miss Michelle's class. Yeah, Miss Michelle. Michelle Martin. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Erin. I teach third grade. I'm at La Cala. Uh, and I'm very excited to meet my new faith and see where this goes. Is that Amelia? Yeah, I'm Amelia Bad. I'm a homeless teacher and I work with um, McDowell Group, which is now McKinley Research. And we do a program evaluation for a number of programs with CLS staff. So it's really honored and excited to be working with you. I'm Laura. I am a reading teacher at Harborview. And something I'm looking forward to is just reconnecting with some of my students from last year. I'm Melissa Kroger. I'm a school counselor out at Off Bay School. And I'm just so excited to see the kids return. Hey, my name is Mike Chesta. Um, I am an MHP student teacher. I'll be here at GD in the Choice Program. Nice. Uh, I'm really excited to um, kind of engage and help build the community in the school. Hi, uh, my name's Dana. I am from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, on the left. More injury people. Um, I am really excited to see my students graduate. So we're we're you know on, almost at the end of our year, um, and they're getting ready to finish. So I'm really looking forward to celebrating that with them. Hi, I'm Jennifer Helby. I'm from um, Texas. I'm a special education teacher at Monte Community Middle School as well, and. I look forward to creating a de-escalation room this year. Hi, I'm Kim Miller, um, and I uh, work for the University of Alaska, and I am based out of Sitka. Um, I'm originally from the Yukon River, up the west coast of Alaska, a little village about 90 people. I'm a Gail fan, and uh, this year I'm looking forward to working with uh, my students, and um, I'm specifically working with first-generation students. And I'm super excited about that because I'm a first generation college student as well. I know all the hurdles and excitement and craziness that come along with that. And um, just looking forward to seeing them succeed and know that they can make it through and navigate through the university system. Uh, I'm Amelia Perkin, I'm a mental health clinician. Um, uh, I'm originally from Toronto, Ontario, and I'm in Mississauga for credit. Um, and this year, I'm excited that I'm equipped to have all my direct contact hours so I can get my professional list insured. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I'm Darcy Stewart, and I am the Ford Flag Special Education teacher at Glacier Valley. And I'm excited to get to know and understand. Um, I have a few students I haven't had a chance to work with yet, so I'm looking forward to that. Thank you, everyone. Um, hopefully, if you're not making connections in this session, you will throughout the conference. Um, so if you wouldn't mind asking the folks online to share in the chat box. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I won't have time to read them all, but I do. This is being recorded, right? Mm -hmm. So I do want to, um, I am interested. <laughs> and maybe uh, you all online can make some connections that way as well. Um, so thank you for bringing a little bit of yourselves into the room. Uh, we do have a short time together, so I'm gonna encourage you to take care of yourself as needed. If you need to go to the bathroom or get some water or stand up, whatever um, helps you learn, please feel free to do so. Um, and then just a content warning. Um, we are going to review what trauma and trauma-informed care are. Um, normally this is where I would show a video on trauma and the nervous system, but um, you can do that as homework. It's a nine minute video. Um, I really like it because it kind of helps you understand like the connection between our bodies and our nervous system and what happens when we're under stress and trauma. Um, but I have that linked in the slides and we'll share that with you at the end as well. Um, sorry, next slide. So what is trauma? Um, I think with all the talk of trauma-informed care in the last uh, few years, we've gotten pretty familiar with trauma, but just to review, this is the SAMHSA definition of trauma. Um, trauma comes from the Greek word for wound, pain, or hurt, and SAMHSA definition is that individual trauma results from an event, series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual or community as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning, mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. Um, and so just an emphasis as we go through healing-centered engagement, um, it can be, trauma can be experienced individually or collectively. Um, trauma is not the event itself, but the experience as a result of a traumatic event. It's a normal response to abnormal circumstances. It's a response to an effects excuse me, response to and effects of trauma um, vary by individual. And uh, Bonnie Burstow, a Toronto psychotherapist, says that trauma is not a disorder, but a reaction to a kind of wound. It is a reaction to profoundly injurious events and situations in the real world, and indeed a world in which people are routinely wounded. Next slide, please. Um, and then just to review trauma-informed care. So. Uh, Healing-centered engagement builds on trauma-informed care. I really um, appreciate everything I've learned about trauma-informed care. I think it's a great foundation for us to understand how better to serve our students and each other and just support each other and be in community together. Um, so trauma-informed care really is about understanding, recognizing, and responding to the effects of all types of trauma. Um, it realizes the widespread impact of trauma and understands potential paths for recovery. It recognizes the signs and symptoms of trauma in clients, families, staff, and others involved with the system. Uh, Trauma-informed care responds by fully integrating knowledge about trauma into policies, procedures, and practices, and seeks to actively resist re-traumatization. Next slide, please. So um, moving from trauma-informed care to healing-centered engagement is, um, in my mind, it really helps me to understand it from going, going from individual to a collective um, perspective. And so um, individual is the person experiencing the trauma. Um, internally, that's the way that the trauma is manifesting in those person's interactions, emotions, well-being. Um, and then the pathology is the treatment of the trauma. Uh, moving forward, such as diagnoses, therapy, medication, and other methods of healing. But we want to move into the future. 
So because we know that individuals can experience trauma, we also know that trauma occurs within with entire communities as well. We've been living in traumatic environments um, collectively for the last two and a half years through the pandemic. Um, some other examples of collective trauma include natural disasters, um, history of slavery and genocide in America. Um, we could, there's plenty of examples to give, um, but those are just a few. So if we aren't working towards healing an entire community, race, ethnicity, or identity, then we're not getting to the environmental nature of trauma, which is really about getting to the root causes of collective trauma so that we can change the effects, not just with pathology or treatment, but by creating space for people to dream, grow, and move into possibilities for change. Next slide, please. Um, this is just another graphic that I like because um, I think it shows the difference between individual um, and then collective. So it goes from individual to interpersonal and then institutional and how um, trauma shows up in our lives uh, collectively. Um, Dr. Jinwright, who is where I got my training on healing centered engagement, calls um, these systems of oppression social toxins. Next slide, please. Um, and then, so after you watch the video on trauma in the nervous system, um, I think it's really helpful to think about normally we would do an exercise on regu like emotional regulation. And so how can we regulate ourselves individually um, or how can we co-regulate with somebody else? Um, and so just talking about um, modeling emo emotional regulation. So children can't be what they can't see. So we have to model emotional regulation for them to um, see that. Um, Emotional regulation is about observing and moving through what we are feeling. So feel your feelings, lean into the discomfort. You probably heard that um, from Brene Brown. Uh, we get to choose, um, not all the time, but we get to choose how to move through the feelings and consider our response patterns. Um, so identifying healthy activities and people to regulate and co-regulate with. Uh, HealthyNativeYouth.org has some good standalone lessons. And so they have a self-care uh, worksheet that I think is, is um, a nice student version of basically the ladder of regulation, which moves you in and out of um, fight, flight, or freeze, and like how we can stay fluid through those state, state, states. Um, and then emotional regulation is about staying present and ultimately regaining control. Next slide, please. Um, so speaking of, of ways to regulate, um, these are some just cultural practices for regulation or what we might refer to as medicine. Um, so regulatory activities require mindfulness, presence, and deep focus. And just some examples um, that you can incorporate are uh, you know, ceremony practices, ceremonial practices, storytelling, dips, sweat lodge, uh, language learning and practice, singing, dancing, and drumming, harvesting, gathering outdoors, hunting and fishing, feeding, sewing, weaving, painting, drawing, etc. So all of these activities engage uh, tensional control, uh, working memory, cognitive flexibility, and inhibitory control skills, which underlie um, the cognitive aspects of self-regulation. Um, so these are all just basically mindful activities. And when we uh, identify those um, on like a self-care worksheet, for example, I know that I can use a reminder when I'm really like in a state of distress. Um, sometimes I just need to see a piece of paper or ask somebody like, what do I need to do? <laughs> Go for a walk because I know that that helps me. Um,
And this is a, a healing centered um, practice as well. Next slide, please. Um, so before we dive into healing centered engagement, um, my question for you all is why does healing matter in our work um, for ourselves and for our students? And so we could just popcorn. Um, Nicole, there's a Jamboard linked into the notes, I believe. Um, if you scroll down on the notes, it's under Jamboard activity. On, on the slide, sorry. Oh, the slide. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, folks online, if you haven't used Jamboard before, um, maybe Nicole can show you how to put a post it on there. But um, does anybody have any thoughts on why healing matters? In our work? I think it's essential because it's not a deficit approach. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you're focusing on um, on on the healing and um, on um, rather than than looking at just the trauma. Because I think we talk about intergenerational trauma even, but there's also intergenerational healing, mm -hmm. and often that gets left out of the conversation. And so I think if we're just trauma focused, you know, that's the space that we're staying in rather than looking at um, how we get to that holistic space of healing. Yes. What's the, there's a saying that's like, what you focus on grows. Mm -hmm. So for focusing on trauma and just what happened to us, it's kind of hard to get out of that yeah. mindset. Um, thank you. Anyone else? Because kids can't learn if they're in a state where they're depressed and anxious and worrying about what is happening in yeah, we can't learn when we're um, under stress and distracted by <laughs> uh, reliving trauma. Anyone else? I think um, if we don't have healing in the workplace, um, what are we passing on, you know, to those that we're trying to teach and affect? Um, when we heal, we help others. We know how to help others heal, and that trickles over into our community and other populations, and, and that's how. You know, it's like love, it spreads. Mm -hmm. You know, hate spreads, love spreads, healing spreads. Um, I had a pastor once say, um, have you ever like rode your bike and you're just learning when you're little? Mm -hmm. And they say, don't look where you don't want to go because you'll go there. <laughs> like, you don't look at the ditch, don't look at the rocks, you will hit it. And that's the same thing as we focus on the positive, you know, how far have we come? Yeah. Um, how we are communicating now. And um, trust is built in safety and this whole happy, happy, healthy people. I like that analogy of the bicycle, learning to ride a bike. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, cool. So, what is healing centered engagement? Um, Healing-centered engagement uh, is a process that aligns institutions with a perspective, approach, and strategy that addresses harm and restores well-being. It supports systems with shifting from a culture of harm, discipline, and confinement to restoration, hope, and healing. Um, this is Dr. Sean Jinright. He's from the Bay Area. Um, I did my training online um, through Flourish Agenda, so there's a link at the end of the slide deck. Um, for that. Um, but like many of you shared, uh, when I asked the question about why healing is important in our work, um, healing centered engagement or HCE asks what's right with you. So it's a strength based approach. Uh, it's a holistic view of healing. So um, not just mental health, it's also physical health, spiritual health, all of the different ways that we take care of ourselves. Um, and it recenters culture and identity. Um, it's a response that allows us to take our knowledge about trauma-informed care to the next level. And it's a perspective in how we see young people and the causes of harms, an approach in how we support them 
and a strategy that we use in our organization. So it's not only a therapeutic response because we're not only using a, a medical model, model to respond and understand trauma. Um, and it supports the systems in shifting from a culture of harm and punishment to open healing. Next slide, please. Um, so I just did a side-by-side -side of the core values of healing-centered engagement and um, the core values as outlined by um, elders, uh, Southeast Alaska Native elders. Um, and uh, they're also on the uh, SHI's website. Um, so on the left, we have uh, healing-centered engagement is culturally grounded. So it's um, healing as a restoration of identity. Um, and then on the right, Pa'ani, honoring and utilizing our land. Um, and then uh, number two for the HCE values is it's asset-driven, so it's strength-based um, well-being. And so I thought that one lined up nicely with Ha Shlatsini, which is our strength of mind, body, and spirit. Uh, number three is it, it, healing-centered engagement is explicitly political. Um, which really means that it's about collective advancement. It's not like necessarily about being involved in politics per se, but um, being in community with each other so that we can all heal together um, and support each other. And I thought that that aligned well with Kibuchiak, which is social and spiritual balance and reciprocity. Um, and then the last one is, it, Healing-centered engagement supports young people and adult providers with their own healing. Um, and I thought that one lined up nicely with Pashika, which is our ancestors. Um, so honoring past, present, and future generations. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Um, so healing-centered engagement, the uh, approach is operationalized through its five karma principles, karma with a C, um, and they are culture and identity, agency, relationships, meaning, and aspirations. And so one of your handouts, um, this three-pager, the karma principles, um, has a nice definition um, and then some explanations of how to implement these at an individual, interpersonal, and institutional level. Um, and then the definitions, again, on the, on the back, why is karma important? And so we'll go through these principles, um, each, five, uh, each of the five principles. Um, again, most approaches view trauma as an individual problem. So most trauma stems from social oppression that impacts us at an individual, interpersonal, and institutional level. These principles are oftentimes the principles that are sacrificed or, or harmed with our exposure to trauma. These five principles are also supported by bodies and bodies of research that says that we, when we focus on them, um, we actually create restoration and healing for young people. And the approach comes from the idea that people are not harmed in a vacuum. And well-being comes from participating in transforming the root causes of the harm at each level. Healing-centered engagement is a process that transforms individual practices, advances healthy interpersonal connections, and improves institutional culture to create healthy outcomes for youth and the adults who serve them. So the first principle is C for culture and identity. Uh, next slide, please, Nicole. So these are all examples of cultural markers. Um, I borrowed these from Dr. Wuerl and her lecture on native identity and blood quantum, which you can find on our YouTube page. Um, but culture really is a system of systems of symbols and meanings around which people organize their lives and interpret their experience. So you might also heard um, like worldview. I think of culture as a worldview too, like that, that impacts our worldview and how we move through the world. Um, culture and identity are at the very foundation of all human interactions. Uh, Zaretta Hammonds writes that culture is the way that every brain makes sense of the world. 
Um, so again, our worldviews are shaped by the culture and communities we identify with. And if you study, um, for example, any indigenous language, I shouldn't say any, but the couple that I'm familiar with, um, like Tlingit and Shemalia, um, when you learn the depth, the meaning of a word, there's so much more um, in the word than it's actually just translated. Like Gunatish, for example, isn't just thank you, it's without you, it would not be possible. Um, so there's really that like interconnectedness in the language. Um, another example I can think of is in Somalia, there's a, an expression, um, it's Luem Godu, Luem Godu, Newell Needson, uh, which means, or the translation is it's good to see you, but really it means my, my heart is happy to see you. Um, so I like those examples um, when I think about worldview because anytime I learn a new word um, in an indigenous language, it broadens my perspective and understanding of the culture as well. Um, so that's just an example of one of many cultural markers. Um, Often our identities are attacked, and particularly if we identify with any groups who are socially marginalized, such as people of the global majority or people of color, LGBTQ folks, differently abled women, um, et cetera. Next slide. Um, more on culture. So culture is about developing an awareness this principle in HCE is about developing an awareness of one's own and others uh, racial and other social identities. Um, and some effective practices include actively engaging with youth in conversations about identity, sharing experiences with youth about harm and healing from aspects of your identity. So I tried to model that a little bit at the beginning, just sharing my a little bit about my reconnection story and my family. Um, Identifying and integrating culturally appropriate procedures and processes, which I'm sure you're learning a lot about at this conference. And uh, creating intentional space, time, projects um, for students to bring their culture into the classroom. And so um, my presentation is, is primarily focused on Indigenous students, but culture is like all of the identities in this room make up the culture of this classroom. And so it's not just race, it's not just um, gender, um, and it's, it's all of the cultural markers and aspects of our identity. Um, next slide, please. And um, I just really like this quote by Shken George. Um, it's from her lecture on my time in Alaska Native Education. I can't remember what it's called, but it's on our my life in education as a Native teacher. Um, and she says, our culture is a lens that we access standards through. And so um, making learning more relevant um, through culture. She also says, our culture. Uh, Presenting in this way gives our kids the opportunity to live in both worlds together so they don't have to compartmentalize as much. Um, so our students shouldn't have to check their identity at the door. They should be able to bring their whole selves into the room. Um, and so that's part of our work in healing centered engagement and creating safe space. Um, and the graphic on the left um, is just an example of how think of people live by the seasons or the tides, like making learning as relevant and practical as possible um, and using things like the seasons and how we learned traditionally um, in the classroom and outside. And then I just really like this. I saw this on a t-shirt, um, the Teach Me My History picture from for all my relations. Question? Um, kind of just a comment if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I think it's important with um, you know um, in working in classrooms and, and you know creating the space for culture is that it, um, you know like you were saying with the wood and the um, 
the value of balance and reciprocity, that it's important for the educators to be part of that space and to share about their culture as well, um, which I think um, is um, something that is, gets forgotten very often. And so I just wanted to add that, that it kind of, it, it makes it that collective experience and that shared um, and reciprocal, um, like, because I just, I think that gets forgotten, and so I just wanted to add that to that it's not just about the students sharing their culture, but um, ensuring that the teachers um, have a voice in the room too, and because we all have a culture. Yes, thank you for adding that. Um, and that goes with like our working on our own healing too. Um, and say, but okay, that's really important. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I might have a really dumb question, but it's no, honestly a question I've had for a long time, and I think it's a good group to ask this. What do we define as culture? What do we, you know, we all have culture, not just our food, our art, and the color of our skin, or what we say we are. What are we defining as culture? Because if it's a safe place to share all culture, my 100% culture above everything is that I'm a Christian. And that's not safe to share in a lot of places. Um, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. I um, I use the definitions from Dr. Roy and, and Dr. Shit Jinright. Um, but I think, you know, if we are really creating a safe space that, um, you know, normally this is a three hour presentation and we would go over uh, like group agreements. And so that's also part of creating a safe space. Um, maybe you've heard there's no such thing as a safe space, but brave space. Um, and I think, I don't know. Um, I agree with you that uh, being Christian is part of your culture. Um, playing softball is part of my culture. Um, it's a little safer to bring that into the room, I think, than maybe um, my religious beliefs, but I don't think that you should have to check that out the door. Um, so that, you're making me think. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Um, but yeah, all, all aspects of your, your interests and your identities, everything that makes you who you are is, is yes. your culture yeah. um, individually. Yeah. I, the only thing I would add to that is that I, I thought a lot about how to bring it up with kids, right? And like how to make it accessible to kids. And I teach, you know, anywhere from like eight, nine, ten or so. But like it's a way of life. And like I mm -hmm. as simple as that. And I've heard it repeated a few of the different keynote speakers. It's your way of life, and you would then have a thing, yeah, whatever it is to you. And so you can bring whatever aspect you want and whatever you feel comfortable bringing. And hopefully, as time goes on, like a school year, for example, mm -hmm. a student might feel more comfortable. You're, you know, so it takes a little bit to, you know, it takes time, as we all know, to build relationships and trust. Um, but like you said, you know, hopefully at some point it might not be immediate, but you should. You would be able. You would feel more comfortable bringing that into the space, um, if, you know, as appropriate. Yeah. Thank you for those comments. Um, next slide, please. So the next principle is agency. Um, agency is the individual and collective ability to act, uh, create, and change the root causes of personal, social, and community challenges. Um, some effective practices include engaging with youth in ongoing political education. So this is also just current events, um, social history, um, providing opportunities for civic engagement, and engaging youth in strength-based approaches to community problem solving. Um, so on the next slide, I have um, a couple of framework examples of how to bring more agency into the classroom. Um, so YPAR is um, youth-led participatory action research. So this is gonna be probably more focused on older students. Um, 
and I don't know a whole lot about it, but AASB has used YPAR um, in some of their work um, around, I think, post-secondary planning. Um, and then uh, really the, the crux of that to me is um, um, exemplified in that graphic that says nothing about us without us is for us. And so we're not making decisions for the students without centering them um, and giving them the agency to go about solving a challenge the way that they want to do that or something that's important to them. Um, and then design thinking is another example um, of a framework that uh, empowers agency. Um, next slide. And then just some local examples of um, things that you can share uh, for, for ideas for civic engagement. So Clint Kit and Haida Youth Commission, um, they have been having uh, youth summits in the last few years as well, um, where they develop resolutions to, pre to pre present to the uh, Tribal Assembly, um, Alaska Native Brotherhood and Alaska Native Sisterhood. Um, this is Tia Silva. She was the youth advisor this last year. I think her term just ended, um, but now she works for Clint Kit and Haida. Um, and then some organizers uh, who were pre prior students of mine at Yakuska Datihiri um, on Orange Shirt Day last fall. Um, so just ideas that you can share with your students about ways to get involved. I've got a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, Orange Shirt Day. Orange Shirt Day is uh, September 30th. Um, it started in Canada to recognize all of the children who were in boarding schools who didn't come home. This is my very, very brief just <laughs> explanation. Um, Public shirt saying every child matters, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the next principle is relationships. So R for relationships. Um, relationships have the capacity to create, sustain, and grow healthy connections with others. Some effective practices include uh, cultivating connections with young people beyond the professional life, um, sharing your story. So bringing your culture into the classroom, for example, Practicing empathy um, and recognizing the value of inclusivity and belonging into your institution or your classroom and fostering a culture of connectedness and safety. Um, at the root of, of many, if not all risk factors is disconnection. And so whether it be disconnection from our families, our culture, our peers, our spirituality, mental and physical health, the community, um, that is uh, a big factor in um, how we are able to heal or not heal is um, being connected to people. Um, you may have heard Brene Brown say something like we're wired for connection, which I think is pretty relatable. Um, when we were in isolation uh, in, in the shutdown, um, especially um, maybe you can relate that just as to how hard that was <laughs> um, on many levels. Um, and we're really focusing on transformative relationships. So there's like two kinds of relationships is transactional and transformational. Um, trans transactional relationships are a function of our titles. So if I'm a teacher, like I'm here to teach you as a student, um, but and they're efficient, but we haven't created a humane connection. And so transformative relationships are healing. They're cultivated when we share pieces of our humanity, when we're vulnerable, when we share our stories. Um, in order for connection to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be seen. And so that's again, um, taking a healthy risk and being vulnerable. Um, vulnerability gives us permission to have a closer, more trusting relationship. I like to think of vulnerability as taking a healthy risk, like I mentioned. Um, sometimes we're less inclined to share pieces of ourselves and be vulnerable with people 
we don't know that well um, because we've been harmed in the past or burned in the past. Um, someone chose not to listen to us or see us and uh, when we shared something hard. And while it's uncomfortable and can, can be disheartening, um, it's a muscle we have to strengthen if we really want to connect with people, particularly our youth on a deeper level. Um, that's Lavander Cook, who wrote uh, The Body Keeps the Score, Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma, writes that being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. So safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. Next slide, please. And then just a plug for restorative practice. Um, I'm co-hosting restorative practice at the next session. And that's a great way to work on building relationships um, in any space or capacity. Um, but it's really about connection and relationships and building trust um, and then repairing harm when as needed. <clears throat> next slide, please. Um, the next principle is meaning. Um, very few people enjoy work that doesn't supply a clear or meaningful outcome. So meaning gives us the opportunity to fully invest in what we do and why. If you take away the what, like your job and the process, so how you do your job, um, you're left with the why, which is purpose or meaning. And the goal of this principle is to build and maintain purpose in young people and ourselves so that we know why we're doing what we're doing. So why are they doing this lesson? Um, I think that's something that I run in, I have run into um, in classroom settings or in camp settings because I haven't been in a classroom in a while. But this past summer, um, I worked in three of the SHI camps, and I it was clear when we didn't share why we were doing something that the students were it was difficult to engage, um, and so that just speaks to the importance of. of meaning um, and sharing why we're doing something. Um, we often tie our lessons and activities in our camps uh, back to Southeast traditional values. And so um, I listed the four uh, on our website at the bottom, but then also um, I really like this longer list as well. Um, and um, like I said, in, in our camps, uh, a lot of the time we try to tie back what all the activities relate to uh, the core cultural values um, and upholding them. And so uh, one exercise that we don't have time for today, but I gave you um, a really basic template for is the personal inventory. And so it's two pages and then I also attached um, the Southeast traditional tribal values, um, because they gave us this worksheet comes with some sample values on the very back page, which are good, um, but I, I wanted to include the Southeast traditional tribal values as well. And so um, this is something you can do for yourself um, or tailor for your students. And it really helps, like, it's something that I like to do um, once or twice a year just to kind of assess like, where am I at with my goals for the year? Um, am, I, am I doing, you know, things that are important or that I'm passionate about? Um, and then um, maybe what areas of my life where I need to focus a little bit more, like on family, for example, I haven't seen my grandma in a couple of months. And so that's something that's been on my mind. Um, so this is a good example or a, a good exercise um, to just reinforce meaning in, uh, in what we're doing in life and work and um, you know how does that align with our personal values. Um, and that should be in the handouts folder online as well. Next slide, please. 
a little bit more on meaning. Um, meaning is about the discovery of who we are, where we're going, and what purpose we were born to serve. Um, some effective practices include creating opportunities for young people to identify their own assets or strengths, um, explicitly communicate those strengths or assets into projects and group interactions, actively seek and incorporate young people's perspectives about social issues. So that's bringing in agency as well um, and building systems of support for adult social emotional growth and well-being too. Um, so I don't, you know, I'm not sure what is available for PD during the school year, um, but if there's time or space to build in it, uh, um, healing and social emotional best practices for yourself too, um, either during during your work time or outside of that um, is also really important for meaning. Um, when we're engaged with youth work, we often get caught up in the grind of the day, the paperwork, meetings, and we, were, and we forget why we're doing this work in the first place. So for young people, this means that we have to cultivate the ability for them so that they have a sense of purpose in their lives. Um, so they're not just going to school or going to camp to learn about things outside of themselves, but they're also learning about themselves and their purpose and meaning and what they want um, to contribute to society. So we create space to ask them what they're good at, um, what's important to them, have them talk about their what their assets or strengths are, um, and then build in activities for them to focus on things that they're good at and want to improve upon. And meaning is a space for us to really engage in building the assets and the strengths that young people bring to our programs and our classrooms. Um, a really good example of these kinds of meaning making or guiding questions that I love is the Click It and Hide a Youth Navigators program. Um, so they have four, four pillars of the program and that's uh, who am I, where am I, where do I want to go, and how do I get there? Um, and just using myself as an example, like I, I like to think that if I had um, been asked those questions or in a program like that as a young person, maybe I would have gotten to where I wanted to be a little sooner. Um, you know, it's never too late, but I definitely was lost for a while um, because I didn't have a purpose or meaning or know who I was. Um, so that's me. <laughs> uh, Next slide, please. Aspirations. Um, aspirations is our ability to dream. Um, in the longer presentation, I shared a little bit from the, um, I can't remember what the survey is called now. The top right, um, School Climate and Connectedness Survey. Um, so I pulled some data from there um, for some of the other principles too, but this was just an example showing that we, um, you know, that students have a, a hard time setting goals for themselves. And so um, this is just where our work comes in on incorporating aspirations, um, which is the exploration of possibilities for our lives and the process of accomplishing goals for personal and collective well-being. And so... Um, some effective practices, including regularly engaging young people in positive discussions about their future, um, keeping those discussions open. So um, a complaint that I've heard from students before is like, I don't want to go to college. Why are people talking to me about going to college? Um, like, you know, having mm -hmm. a broader open concept and conversation about future planning um, and what what options are available after high school. Um, creating opportunities for dreaming and imagination building. So really to me, that just says play time. <laughs> um, creative time, building opportunities for goal setting, um, and then embedding opportunities that reinforce asset driven language. So using strength-based language um, is, a, is really important to me. Um, I think because even when their students aren't in the room, like they're going to hear about how we're talking about them, um, even if it's not at the time. And just so just an example I'm thinking of is like 
when we talk about achievement gaps um, and calling them opportunity gaps instead of achievement gaps, for mm -hmm. example, that was kind of a mind shift for me. Um, I can't think of anything else off the top of my head, but um, just being really conscious about the language that we're using when we're talking about our students and ourselves. Um, next slide, please. Um, more on aspirations. So <clears throat> Dr. Shin, Jin Wright uh, says that the greatest casualty of injustice is a threat to imagination and hope. Um, so when he, uh, one of the ways that he talks about like strength-based language is instead of um, being anti-racist, for example, he says like pro-liberation. Um, and so when I read the Reimagine the Future, Reimagine Justice, it just makes me think of like reimagining instead of just resisting. Resistance, of course, is really important, um, but also like how are we going to move forward? Um, we want to encourage dreaming. Um, I really love this question, what kind of ancestor do you want to be? Um, and then I have a video uh, of Kinga Stay. Um, and we couldn't access it on uh, Nicole's computer. So I'm just going to show you on my computer <laughs> really quick. And then she's going to share that the link to that um, with the folks online. Um, and I love this. This is just a clip from from this conference, uh, I think in 2010. Um, and just how we really need to be champions for our students to help them and encourage um, dreaming <clears throat> and I think it really speaks to the positive language um, when we're talking about aspirations as well for strength-based language. So I'm just going to turn this up as much as I can. <laughs> And just a warning, I, um, I cried the first couple of times I watched this. So tears are welcome. Again. One more time. You are intelligent. You are intelligent. You are a genius. How many were called a genius today? We hardly ever use those kind of words. But our people, when they were talking to their children, they didn't hold back. They didn't sit back and say, well, they didn't take a test. We don't know whether they're really smart or not. Uh, they said, you are intelligent. You are intelligent. You can learn. And if you learn to listen, there is not a thing you can't learn. This is the power of the educational system of the Clinton way. It is so powerful. You're sitting on the evidence of what the elders that came down thousands upon thousands of years, you're sitting in a room where people believe what they were told. They studied laws. They were able to study law and they became lawyers. Some of them became engineers. Some of them became teachers. Some of them became ministers. Some of them became business people right in the midst of what's going on because of the way they were taught for thousands upon thousands of years. So they would tell them, you are intelligent. You are a genius. There's not a thing you can't learn. And they would, my, my grandma would say at the end, all of you try that. Do it again. You know what that that's like saying, oh, you precious thing, you. Oh, you precious thing. I um, always love the way that he talks to, I mean, anytime that Kingisay was in the, 
in a room. Um, he always reminded us how precious we are um, and intelligent. Um, and so if we could all <laughs> take notes from Kingus Day, um, one of the um, things that I've heard is that when the way that we talk to our children or our students becomes like their own internal self-talk. And so that's just a really good reminder um, how we how we talk to our kids. Um, next thing is an activity. So there was one other thing I wanted to mention about aspirations um, that I didn't think about until recently. Um, when I was at Yakuska Dakikiri so I was there for three years, um, and I was the after school program site manager, and so everything that I did was outside of school hours. Um, but a lot of the students, um, at least when I was there, uh, were had jobs um, or were busy watching siblings. Um, and so it, it was something that hadn't occurred to me before, you know, because I would get my feelings hurt because kids wouldn't come to my program. <laughs> and they're like, I have to work. I have to watch my little brothers and sisters. Um, and so it really made me think about um, having time and space and the ability to dream. And like, what does that look like depending on, um, you know, your, your life at home or at work? Um, and so I was thinking about like, if we're in a constant state of survival, which is even as a young person, if you're 14 and you're working already, you're watching your siblings, that doesn't leave a lot of room or time to dream. And so um, I just, it, it really made me think about um, creating intentional space and time to do that during the school day, um, which, you know, I don't have the power to say that we need to do that <laughs> necessarily. I mean, I'm saying that we need to do that, but like getting, thinking outside of the box, um, and, and starting early with creating space and activities for kids to dream um, and all the way through, through school. Um, I also, the aspirations also makes me think about um, Afrofuturism and indigenous futurity. So um, it's sci-fi, but I, I didn't, uh, I was never into sci-fi until, until recently when I started reading um, some, some authors and I can't remember. Oh, Laura Harjo um, is one of the authors who wrote um, Spiral to the Stars. Uh, and it's in, it's an indigenous futurity um, book. And it's really about reimagining the future. And um, it was really hard for me to think like that because um, while I grew up pretty privileged as a young person, um, like dreaming outside of what is currently happening right now just didn't make sense to me. Um, and now, now it does. And so imagining a systems and a society where everybody is actually free and liberated, um, I think helps us get creative uh, for, for how we dream and, um, and work on our aspirations. Um, the next thing, we have is a group activity. And so, um, how many people are online? There's 20. So it's a four, three girl rooms of five. Is that right? Why don't you just have them do, we'll do all five principles for them. So, five groups of four. Five groups of four. Yeah. Um, so, the activity uh, is you're going to get out your implementation plan template. So you'll get out your implementation plan. You're also going to use your karma principles as a guide. Um, and then I'm going to give your groups a letter. And I know we all work with different age groups. So I'm just going to challenge you to get creative um, and collaborate and brainstorm um, an activity or practice. It can be more than one, um, but, but think about it as if you're collaborating in the classroom. Um, of uh, an activity or a practice to bring into the classroom that incorporates your karma principle. And so um, you guys are going to be C for culture. Um, you guys will be agency. And then you four are going to be relationships. 
um, meaning and aspiration. So we'll take um, 10 minutes to do that. The implementation plan um, divides up into individual, interpersonal, and institutional, but you can just use the classroom as an example. Um, and then we'll come back and share our activities in 10 minutes. Uh, we talked about like kids bringing in their different foods from their culture. Potluck or something? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> That'd be super fun. And as a way for um, parents um, to be engaged too, because um, you know, culture isn't always a good, kind of back to what I was sharing um, earlier. Um, it's uh, can be uncomfortable for people, and so creating the space for for sharing in a um, in a, like a non scary way, of bringing some food in and whatever food that you you know the families get to decide, but. Um, there's some uh, cultural diversity within the uh, Montessori school that they work in, and so an opportunity for people to um, share foods uh, together. I love that. Um, Thank you for bringing in families too. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good point. That um, it, you know, bringing in families as much as possible is, uh, you know, um, Dr. Sobolev talks a lot about like how education is really a community effort. So it's not just the students and teachers, it's the families and community members. And, um, so thank you. Like that. Um, and then we're gonna do A online, so. I think that was us, some of us. Can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Hi. Yeah, we can hear you. Hi. Um, so we were, a little confused at first and we spent a lot of time um, introducing ourselves to the little group um but yeah we just talked um like we read over the principles um and the uh matrix but i don't think we got to like talk about an activity that's all right. Anyone was in our, else in my group? Yeah. Yeah, we didn't know if we were group one or group two and what the directions are. Maybe the person that's putting us in break rooms can uh, put in chat what the activity is that we, you would like for us to do in the future. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. This hybrid is um, That's okay. A bit challenging. <laughs> Maybe we have fun talking to ourselves and introducing ourselves. Yeah. It was a productive conversation, nonetheless. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, relationships. Want to share? Uh, well, yes. Real quick, the first thing we talked about was just creating a safe space um, where everyone felt comfortable and could trust each other. And then um, we talked about kind of some activities that we've used in the past as morning circles to kind of talk and process, but then also the afternoon closing circles at the end of a classroom day to talk about what happened during our day, how it made you feel. Um, that could be, I felt, I felt blank when, and it tends to open up really good conversations and create connections, but it's last thing was um, the importance of modeling and even using prompts like in conversations, um, like I hear what you say, but I think, or I like what you said, I also think this to just build up that vocabulary. Thank you. I love that's a great example of restorative practice and bringing everyone's voice into the room. Can I just add to that that um, we thank the thanking students as well, mm -hmm. and I think that's something that has happened a lot today. Everyone has been thanked for being here and that builds that relationship. Yeah, really strong. Yeah, thank you. Um, relationships, meaning online. The uh, meaning group want to share what you came up with? <laughs> Was that us? No. Um, okay. It was myself. I'm not turning my on because my internet is iffy. If I ask too much of it, it gets grumpy. Yes, so, I understand that. 
<laughs> so it was myself, Ty, and Patty Adkinson. And I don't think we really did a, a activity. We just kind of talked about sharing what we are as people with our students when we engage with them and what our identities are or our peculiarities. Um, so I, I share that I'm an introvert and I don't wake up well. So I get up early. So I have words by the time I get to school because otherwise I tend to kind of scowl and growl at people, which is something I have shared with students to say, this is how I manage my particular personality. Um, Ty, Patty, do you have anything to share? Um, I think, Tanya, you just shared some really great examples because you work specifically with students in special ed. Um, and so like when you were talking about how you move through the day and how you manage some of those things, um, you, we can also have conversations with youth in your classroom about some of their specific challenges and identities and the ways that they move through the world in different ways than most people. Um, and and find some deeper understanding in that when talking about what is helpful for them and finding some purpose in that. Thank you. Did you have something to add, Jennifer? Our group was um, on mute. <laughs> It was said that the host was had um, muted our conversation, oh, okay. and so I'm sorry. I thought we you actually were didn't. no. Okay. Um, thank you, meaning group. Um, it sounds like uh, really knowing yourselves is helpful to bringing meaning to and purpose to what you're doing in the classroom um, and sharing with the students. Um, and then the last group is aspirations in the class and here in person you want to share what you came up with sure um i shared a couple of things um like the local workforce commission does a quick two-day that um, virtual and we talk about soft skills so um, i was just explaining it's not just that teacher doctor environment right um we talk about the soft skills which is having a conversation that we did in the you know, to reach our aspirations. Um, we also talked about um, asking what qualities do you want to see in the future so that students are often telling you what qualities they want as well. And then letting them share dreams and then kind of working backwards, almost like a sims type simulation of like what are the steps that I need to get do to get to that, that point in my life. Thank you. Soft skills or social emotional skills are highly undervalued. I, I think we're moving in the right direction, but um, that's a really good point. So thank you. Um, I think that was all of the principles. Do you want to put the last slide up just for yeah. reference? Um, thank you so much yeah. for coming to the session. Um, there's a bunch of amazing people and resources um, that I can share with you, but there's a lot of them here. So. I'll let you go to lunch. Um, I'll send you the slide decks and a couple of other resources that I didn't print out for you. It was so nice to meet you. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you. See you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.